long has it been since you've watched this film with an audience? And how was the experience just now sitting in and, and getting all the reactions again after 30 years? Oh, I, I saw it with an audience about three years ago at a screening, mm -hmm. and I hadn't seen it for many years before that. But this was good because the print's so much better. It's so nice to the see it's so amazing. sharp and good. It was it really so phenomenal. Good. That so, um, and you're a great audience, so it was good to sit with you and watch it. Oh my god! Yeah, you laughed in all the right time. <laughs> well, for me, this is the first time I've seen it with an audience since the premiere that we had 30 years ago. So. You were great, guys. <laughs> you laughed. <laughs> Did any of the audience reactions surprise you at all? Just that they laughed. <laughs> <laughs> they found it funny, which is great, because there's the story of the test screening when we yeah. first test screened it, that the, the first um, real audience that mm -hmm. saw it in, in the movie theater, it, it was silent because they didn't know that they were allowed to laugh and that... They didn't know a lot of stuff. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's still such an unusual film for its time as well, and kind of a, such an unusual teen film, too. Um, what kind of attracted you to the project when you first read the script or when it first kind of landed in your lap? I was given the script because Dan Waters, who wrote this brilliant thing, was looking for an agent. And I was out of film school and had landed an agent. and. And a mutual friend of ours, I knew Dan, but a mutual friend said, well, Dan didn't want to ask you directly, but uh, he needs to find an agent. Will you show it to your agent? And I said, well, let me read it first. And I got this big, thick uh, piece of work that was uh, amazingly funny. Tome. Yeah, a tome. <laughs> and uh, I read it, and I told Dan, this is, this is great. And I took it to my agent, and she signed him. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, what about you? What did you first think of the film when you were approached for it? Uh, well, I, I was approached to, to mm. audition for a character in, in, in the film. I didn't read the whole script. I just got what are called sides mm -hmm. and go on an audition. And I was reading for Heather number one. And um, just the from those three pages, I just thought the dialogue was incredible and, and hilarious and like nothing I had ever read for before. And I was like, sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and Michael, this was your first feature film as well. Yeah. Um, and you kind of put together this extraordinary cast, yourself included, obviously, mm -hmm. of incredible young actors as well. Like Winona was barely 16 when you yeah. cast her. And um, you, we think, were just out of high school by the time you were cast. So kind of what was, what was it like to find the right people for those roles and to really get that material? It was really hard to find them. You know, I, I had it in my head that we needed to cast real teenagers as much as possible. And I, I mean, I had it in my head that I would only cast real teenagers. And so um, we went on the search, you know, because a lot of the stars of teen movies at the time were in their mid-20s. And <laughs> even though they did great work, there was something, there felt something inauthentic about it. And if you, when you look at the movie now, and you see Shannon, who was 15, mm -hmm. and I think turned 16 during the shooting. Yeah. Did she? Something like that? So, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. And, and Winona had yeah. just turned 16. And Kim Walker, who plays uh, Heather Chandler, was 19. Mm -hmm. And Lizanne was only, she, what, you were 12, 13? Yeah, something yeah, like I that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, looked, I looked good, you know, older for my age. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, continue. Just, it, I mean, Lizanne gave a great audition. The, mm -hmm. the, the people we cast all auditioned well, but it was a long, tough process. Yeah. And you cast it well. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> really cast those Heathers well. <laughs> and what was the vibe like on the set? Um, did you kind of form particular bonds with any of the other cast members? What is a, was it a challenging or fun shoot? What do you think, Michael? Did you tell them the real story? or No, <laughs> unfortunately, this is always, I wish I could dig up some good dirt, but yeah. we, we were a very happy bunch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Dan and I were good friends, and Denise Denovi, who produced the movie, was great and really supportive. And so we, ha we had, and the, the production group mm -hmm. was generally a, a happy crew that did great work, and we all liked the script, and we all loved the cast. So unlike many movies that have all sorts of terrible personal interactions, this one was was really happy, and the cast, you guys yeah. were amazing. Yeah, so got along, which doesn't yeah. always make a good movie. A happy set doesn't always make a mm. good movie, but in this case, I think it worked. Yeah, 
I, I keep trying to come up with really sort of good, evil, Dish. nasty dish <laughs> things. Come on, but let's I, make I, some stuff up. <laughs> you, you probably know more of them. I was very busy. Oh, no, I don't to know anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's all did good. You, did you form any particularly close bond with any of the other um, actresses? When uh, you I would, yes, I, I, I became really good friends with Winona. Mm -hmm. we, we, we seemed to have the same sensibility, and we bonded together and seemed to laugh at the same things. And, and um, yes, we, we had a good time together. <laughs> Um, it was a fairly low budget for the time, mm -hmm. wasn't it? So did you kind of had to do any resourceful maneuvering around some of the scenes um, that you had to do? Yeah, pretty much all of them. <laughs> 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 it, it is so funny. I watch it now and I think, oh, you know, I wish we could have gotten a better location for that. Or I know, I know why I shot it that way, because if you looked three inches to the left of that frame, you would see something the that was palm totally trees. wrong. That was the first time that I noticed the Did palm you see trees. Him? Yes, I never noticed that before in the in the um, at mm -hmm. a funeral scene in the corner of Sherwood, Ohio. Where That's a correct. Line of palm trees. Yeah, but I, <laughs> I'm pretty sure those are the only ones you can yes, see. Yes, I'm yeah. sure. I was so busy looking at the, you know, the great acting. I had never noticed it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I want to talk a little bit about the style of the film as well. There's kind of these wonderful surrealist elements to it as well, particularly in the funeral scene. Um, you know, what were some of your points of reference as well for building, building kind of those scenes? Oh, you, uh, just about every fun movie I'd ever seen. <laughs> that there were things that you know, playing around with that, that element with everybody wearing the 3D sunglasses or 3D viewing glasses, that there's a famous photograph from the 1950s of a, of a crowd watching a drive-in movie or watching a 3D movie with the glasses As on. In Life magazine, right? Yeah, Isn't it? Uh, things like that. Uh, a lot of, you know, I gotta say, a lot of what's great in this movie, visual and, and verbal, was in the script. It was, I was oh, handed. Michael, you're so humble. No, it's true. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not. Actually, <laughs> I'm so lucky. Uh, oh. the, the Dan script was, in, was really visual, mm -hmm. which was great because it gave us an opportunity to, you know, integrate the visuals in with the movie in a, in a good way. And, and he had good vision. And, and also, the designer, John Hutman, was incredible. He was a kid, he was about 25 years old, and he came in filled with ideas. So, you know, it was very collaborative, and uh, for me as a first-time filmmaker, I had, you know, a lot of big ideas <laughs> and, and wanted to get all of them on screen, so, you know, we worked hard. And, um, Lizanne, if I can ask you a little bit about your character as well. Heather McNamara is kind of the softest or the sweetest of the mean girls in the film. Yes. <laughs> Mellow yellow, sunshine. Yes, and also let's take a moment to publicly appreciate Lizanne's ode with the yellow scrunchie. Yeah. Thank you. The Hellers. <laughs> My daughter made this for me in her textiles class, so it has a lot of meaning. <laughs> um, but going back to um, Heather McNamara, um, kind of, how did you feel playing her? Because she's very mean at the beginning, and she kind of softens after Heather Chandler dies, and she becomes much more the victim of the bullying rather than the perpetrator. Well, that, that's one of the things that I personally liked about mm. playing that particular Heather, because I felt like... Uh, she had a vulnerability to her that that maybe the other Heathers didn't have, and um, I liked the transition of of being like I was so happy to be there and part of the in crowd, but then as the the kind of veneer wore off and and things came apart, the reality of of my life felt you know badly you know to to, to me and and um, you know so much so that I I thought I wanted to end my life. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was nice to have that transition from being a kind of a bully, horrible person to wanting to be a good person. And um, what, I mean, we're all here kind of 30 years after the release. Um, what do you think about this film kind of still speaks so loudly and clearly to audiences, to teenagers and young people? and? You know, the, it, it, all the cliches of adolescent experience are either properly exploited in the movie or turned on their head or played around with somehow. I mean, it, it is really true that the social structures of high school, that sort of thing, they, they do endure. Mm -hmm. And even things that felt like they could have been tired back then, we, we tried to inject a very dark, humorous approach to, to those elements. And weirdly, that still, for me at least, kind of still plays. It's right. still alive. And so 
uh, you know, the, it, the world is a different place now than it was 30 years ago, and it's exactly the same place that it was 30 years ago. Yes, high school experience can be the same on that level, uh, regardless of when it happens, and mm -hmm. just trying to find out who you are, what you're made of, how much, you know, how, how much you feel the need to fit in, and how confident you feel to be independent and, and free thinking and that's why Veronica is such a great character because she starts off wanting you know she is mm -hmm. part of the in crowd and then has a whole you know questioning of, of who she is and, and realizes this isn't what it's cut out to be and I mean that's one of the great things about her is that she's sort of the outsider in the in yeah. crowd um, kind of trying to understand them and rip them apart from the inside out almost and she's so ambiguous as well, morally ambiguous from the beginning, because she's she's privy and part of that that bullying and that system. Yeah, you know, it, it is watching the movie again. You, you realize that what Dan wrote were very emotionally and morally com complex characters, and that's not typical in teen movies, mm -hmm. and it's not typical in movies even your even the movies that are adolescent coming of age stories that are about how you come come of age emotionally. These kids are very verbal and they're very self aware. And they may be falsely self-aware, but they're, they got a lot to say about it. And um, that, that holds up for me watching it. And I think that captures an aspect of being a teenager and being a smart teenager and quite often being a privileged teenager mm -hmm. that you don't see on screen very often. Yeah, it's not black and white. Nothing's no, black and white. No. So. Mm -hmm. There's this, um, it feels like such a capsule of its time watching it again now, but also completely removed from anything else. Um, kind of made during the 80s. And I think language, you mentioned it, is kind of a big part of it because it almost, there's so many expressions that are just <coughs> made up for the film. They're not really something that people or teenagers were saying in the 80s, was it? Yes, that's the, the, that's the beauty of Dan's language is mm. it, it doesn't feel dated because it's made up and, it, and, and it's so quotable. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> There was so much kind of fun being had with teenage language at the time, mm -hmm. playing off of the actual language that people used, and it became tired very quickly, and it became cliched very quickly. And Dan invented most of that language, and he invented it based on the actual patterns of teen speak at the time. Mm -hmm. And so, it, and it's funny, and it's usually better than the way teenagers really spoke, so it was uh, kind of fun kind of fun to play with it. The, the most interesting thing at the time, I remember in auditioning people mm -hmm. and talking to people we were trying to get involved in the, in the movie, adults kept saying, well, kids don't talk like this. This is not an accurate representation of the way children speak, and the language is too foul. They don't use these words. And every young person <laughs> who came not. in said, this is just Never the way yet. we talk. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this is so much Never, the way we are. <laughs> I mean, the adult characters are hilarious as well. They're yeah. so exaggerated. Yeah, I'm glad to have grown up to become one of those. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm not like that at all. <laughs> totally aware. Um, did you have kind of fun as well? Because you're such a young crew and an incredibly young director and writer and um, kind of uh, a lot of the other people involved in the film. Did you have fun directing actors that were much, much older than you into <laughs> these really bizarre yeah, roles? Yeah, I want to know about that. I don't, I don't remember. Oh, they were easy. Yeah. No, you, you know, it, it is. It actually was fun. There was, I was not that young, but I was still closer to high school age <laughs> than some of the older actors. Mm -hmm. But... Um, they were all game for it. You know, th that was a good group. It was generally uh, a pretty easy group of actors to direct in terms of, people didn't show up at the set and, and they weren't yeah. horrible. You didn't go, oh my God, what have I done? How am I gonna make this work? So that was, uh, you know, we had good casting directors on the movie. <laughs> And um, you mentioned one of the early test screenings before, but at the time that the film was released um, in the U.S. first in, in cinemas, it wasn't a huge commercial success. Um, but can you talk a little bit about kind of how um, how those first reactions were and kind of maybe why it, f it failed kind of to connect to an audience um, back then, but obviously since then has riled it up? I think that's a little bit misleading when people talk about box office in relation mm -hmm. to this movie. It was made by on a low budget by a company that never really released movies that had big box office, mm -hmm. and it wasn't really expected to perform that way. So, you know, it premiered at the Sundance Film Festival, yeah. and it was released more as an art film. And it was doing very well as an art film, 
in the two weeks that it was in the theaters before New World went out of business. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, that's the bit, I think, that they, because the, the company went out of business, so they didn't get to follow. Oh, follow they didn't follow up, up at all? Yeah. They didn't pay for advertising or anything. Yeah. So, which is fine, which isn't to say that it did perform especially well, mm. but it wasn't expected to do a whole lot of box office. The, the, I think for the people who invested in the movie, they expected to make money in home mm. video and in international releases where it was released as a lethal attraction around the world. Uh, yeah. I think this screening put the box office over the top. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Finally, we're in profits. <laughs> Made that, that three million, woo! <laughs> Um, and um, since you've been revisiting it for several screenings or reissues, re-releases, has kind of your reaction or your appreciation for certain elements of the film changed at all? You go. <laughs> well, the the uh, I would say the the biggest thing for me in recent times is um, rewatching the film with my daughter, who's a teenager, mm -hmm. and watching it through her eyes and and asking her you know, her opinion and what she thinks the teens of today, uh, you know, would think of the movie and is it mm -hmm. shocking and relatable and, um, and, and that, that's the um, bit where I got that the hierarchy of, of teen life in schools mm -hmm. is still the same and flourishing on, on every level and, and, you know, there are always the popular people and the people who aspire to be the popular people and then the people who are the fringe people um, so that that was the the, the most relevant um, part to her as mm -hmm. a young teenager. <laughs> I've always expected to see the movie and watch it as if I were watching Asphalt Jungle or Rebel Without a Cause when I was young. You know, oh, it's going to look dated. It's going to be funny because it's dated. I can laugh at the hairstyles and the way people you behave. Can laugh at the I, and I do <laughs> that's just, absolutely. And and what I what I think is great watching the movie is that that is true. Mm -hmm. It is this funny uh, interpretation of the 1980s fashions and styles and points of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, but, um, but it also, because, because the language is so original and because the humor is so dark, it still, it still works in a funny way. And, and I think it's a testament to the, to the kind of humor that, that we were aiming for, that you just don't see it in this context, really. It feels like I mean, obviously, it's a really dark comedy, and um, even at some in later on in the point in the movie, JD says something like high school is society. Yeah. So it's really clearly kind of positioned as a satire of American society and whatnot. Do you think um, it feels almost more relevant now than it did thirty years ago? And I'm thinking particularly of the way that it shows how rumors can really affect or make or break a young person's, and particularly a young woman's um, life, be it in high school or outside of it. Yeah, you, you know, people talk about violence in schools, and sometimes they talk about that in relation to this movie, and this predated a lot of contemporary high school violence, it predated all of it, basically, and what we weren't aiming at that, that's it's a different avenue, mm -hmm. but really when you watch the movie now, you say, aha, it was on target regarding bullying mm -hmm. and the nature of that kind of cruelty among teenagers, and that was always what the movie was about anyway. Yeah. So y I think you're right. I mean, I think that really holds true today, and um, it, pr it also, there was no social media then. Phew. So that, <laughs> that kind of behavior was more direct. Yes, yeah. the, the innocent note passing as opposed to the, you know, five seconds and your life is over because somebody texted yes. some yeah. horrendous thing about you that may or may not be true. So it, it, that, that does make it a more innocent time. But it's really interesting how, you know, with your character, Heather McNamara, how her vulner vulnerability yeah. is exploited and turned into something negative. Yeah. And um, with Martha in particular, I love, I mean, it's the saddest part of the movie for me, the fact that she doesn't speak till the very, very end shot, almost, but she's always in the background and she's the one character who's suffering, but who gets joked about. But she about. does find her voice then at the end, yeah. so that's the upbeat part of it. And she finds a friend. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You, you asked if, did you? Uh, n well, I don't think anybody sets out to make a cult classic. I think something becomes a cult classic. So I think we were setting out just to make a good movie that people could relate to. And then, um, yeah, that, that's, what ha that's what becomes a cult when it, 30 years later, people are still interested and engaged and talking about it. 
So, unless you set out to make a cult no. classic. No, I mean, you set out to make the best movie yeah. ever made. You know, yes. you, you, know yes. you, you think, I'm going to just knock this thing out of the park. It's going to be so perfect. And about uh, partway through the first hour of the first shooting day, you realize, okay, I just want to get it done. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> just let me finish. I'm just let me finish. Yeah. But um, we did know that the script was special. And we also knew that the cast was really amazing. So by the time we started shooting, there was not no sense of we're going to make a great film or this is going to have a cult following or anything. But it was, we set out to make this really odd, really funny, really dark film, and it and and it might work. So there was that level of confidence. And when it was finished, we all looked at it and, and said, "Wow, this thing really it's it's actually pretty good." You know, it kind of it makes us laugh or whatever. So. You know, uh, my friends, all, all the people that we were making the movie with were all very tough critics and tough, tough self-critics. So we weren't entirely happy, but we thought we had something pretty good on our hands. We were definitely, obviously, aware of, we all were fans of and, and fully cognizant of the teen movies of the time, and in particular, John Hughes movies. This movie was never in intended as a reaction to them or a satire of them. You know, we were making it concurrently with some of those films, but we definitely set out to make a movie that was very different in sensibility. And we knew that, and we wanted that, and we made it clear to everybody that this was not going to be like those kind of movies, as much as we actually liked them. Uh, and, uh, and the original ending, uh, the school blows up and there was a prom in heaven. It was, it was really good. I'm sorry to say we can't show that to you because we never no. were able to shoot it. <laughs> but uh, the, the financiers supported most everything that was in the script, which was great and unexpected. But Dan and I were told that uh, we wouldn't get the movie made at New World Pictures if we didn't change the ending. And then we turned around quickly, looked to see if there was anybody else ready to finance the movie, and we found nobody <laughs> so we we reluctantly changed it but i'm not in, i'm not entirely unhappy with this change i would have preferred it to end the way dan originally wrote it but uh you know somebody else can make that one <laughs> oh that's a good question there are things that didn't make it to the final cut because they didn't really work they weren't outrageous enough. yeah they, sometimes <laughs> they, they weren't outrageous, work, outrageous. Uh, yeah. the, the whole cafeteria sequence in the beginning was longer and it had more stuff that was pretty great on page, but what we found was it took too long for the movie to kick in. And so even though that material was good, it just, you wanted the story to really start. Uh, there were kind of questionable scenes, like when, when Veronica takes a shower clothed after the first uh, murder, there was a whole sequence in which the geeky boys looked through a peephole in the shower. That's two porkies. And, yes, and well, it was it was meant to be a, a joke on yeah. porkies, okay. which was, a, and, and all the other girls in the locker room went clothed into the shower, oh, so yeah. they were oh, going, "What? We've been cheated!" This is, and, and it it was really stupid, yeah. and and we shot it because it was also kind of silly fun, but we'd never made it into the cut. We had to cut down some things before shooting just to meet the budget, um, you know, and to, and to meet schedule. the schedule. So, that, you know, that, that happens. It happened on this film, not a whole lot. Uh, no, I wouldn't say, I think there was a cut that was, well, it could have been as much as 10 or 15 minutes longer at one point, but that was before the whole thing got tightened up. So I'm not really sure how much material, you know, if there's five minutes worth of material or 10 minutes worth of material that was shot and cut and screened and deemed not right for the final film. That always happens when you make movies. It's part of the process. Um, I screened an earlier version of the movie for a group of friends who were pretty sophisticated about filmmaking or so I thought, and they all came up to me afterwards and said, man, you blew it too bad, you fucked it up, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, oh, no, 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 this is, uh, we're, we're playing around, you, you, it'll get much better in the cutting room. And, then it, and it did get better in the cutting room. Well, I, wait, I just remembered something as you were talking. I did a bunch of cartwheels that I worked really hard on, and, and you cut them out of the movie, oh. and I was always really <laughs> upset. It was my one, you know, and my that I actually did cheerleading. Oh. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really sad. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to ask him. <laughs> oh, I think he might have been up to some uh, bad things in those schools. 
definitely <laughs> wasn't stable. <laughs> maybe he was conceiving of, I think maybe it was a buildup, and then he yeah. found his right partner in crime to, you know. We, we never projected a backstory on him in which he had actually committed other murders. So when, when Veronica says, hey, that's good, have you done this before, when they do the first suicide note, and he raises his eyebrows, as he tends to do quite a bit in this movie, <laughs> uh, the point wasn't, yes, he's done it before, but no, it's been building to this yeah. point. And also yeah. with the, you know, it was innocent with the, the, you know, he didn't really mean for her to take the, the no whole rust cleaner. That's he was, right. He was trying to stop her, and then, and then it just... You right, know. he didn't know he was doing anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this is Innocent something that's mistake. part of American life. Don't you guys know that? <laughs> we don't do bad things. They just happen. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, God. Wait a minute, they're rebooting it with all the same people, but we're really old. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't, you know, we didn't graduate from high school. We're still there and we can't get out. <laughs> no, I oh think uh, <laughs> Heather's with Justin Bieber is going to be incredible. <laughs> You're saying it's relevant 30 years on, so... Uh, After climate change in yeah. 30 years? <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> We hope so. We hope we're, we hope we're sitting here in another. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I would hope that we would evolve. Uh, we haven't during my lifetime, but there's always, there's always hope. Phew! <laughs> 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 I think that is when we, when we talk about that we thought we were making something different and unique and special. It was because we hadn't seen anything like it before, and and you seeing it now and saying, oh, now I see its influence. And I think that is the aspect of it that for me makes me really proud is to see the influence that it's had on, on uh, you know, teen movies, high school movies going forward and, and um, taking the good aspects of it. I actually, because I have been asked that question, which one of the characters, and I would say out of all the characters in the movie, the one that was most like me is Betty Finn. I was a bit of a goody two-shoes. I really liked to do well, and um, I studied really hard, and I didn't like groups of people. I preferred having one-to-one -one friendships, so I, I don't know what that would be classified. Maybe I was a nerd, too. <laughs> goody two-shoes, I don't know, teacher's pet kind of a thing. I was a Heather. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Uh, the stoner Heather. <laughs> the stoner Heather. <laughs> she got cut out of the movie. <laughs> yeah, they asked about that. That was the one that we were missing. <laughs> the director of photography of the movie, Francis Kenny, came to me one day and he said, I, I want to work on the color scheme the same way you have the color scheme worked out in, in terms of characters and that sort of thing. I said, yeah, sure, that's, that's a great idea. And he said, there's a gel called Congo Blue. And I said, uh-huh. And he said, it's really dark, and it's really blue, and it's really great. And I said, OK, that sounds like a good idea. So we used it. And in the intervening years, when I've talked to directors of photography, they go, yeah, Congo blue. <laughs> I, for some reason, nobody took that seriously. But yes, we did, we did deliberately put this Congo blue gel uh, around the light when, uh, when the JD character was up to something evil. And every time he committed an evil act, there's the sound of a crow. Oh, so next time, next, if you ever watch it again, there is a death crow. <laughs> wow. And the death okay. crow appears at specific moments in the movie. It's funny, I've never noticed that, have you? <laughs> I, I've never heard that before. Yeah, yeah, I've never heard that before. That's just Christian, really. Uh, <laughs> no, seriously, the, the, uh, Cri Christian and I spoke about this as we were making the movie and before, and, it, and I was concerned that it sounded as if too much as if he was doing a Jack Nicholson. And I did, in his defense, very much in his defense, virtually every young actor that auditioned for the part was imitating somebody. I don't know why, I, to this day, I cannot figure this out. James Dean's? Yeah, name. James Dean, they were, they, whoever they were imitating at the time. Um, you know, it, so Tom Cruise even at that point, that whatever it was, it, it was very hard to find a r truly original <laughs> approach to the character. And the fact is that Christian talks like Jack Nicholson naturally. His eyebrows. Yes, and he has the arching eyebrows. <laughs> These are not affectations. 
So at the points at which I'd say, let's make sure you're not going too far into this, char- into this direction, he would look at me and say, this is how I talk. <laughs> and, and that's how he talked. And there was, that's what it was. So, you know, yeah, it, it, it was an interesting kind of model to go off, but I don't think he was really doing an imitation. And it wasn't, it wasn't like we said, let's, let's approach it this way. I have seen Heather's the Musical on several occasions, and I absolutely love the show. And um, I have uh, I was invited to the opening night at, with Dan Waters was there. You weren't invited, sorry, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just to to me the the essence of the show. I think it really focuses on the female empowerment part of it, which is my girls can do anything. <laughs> Um, and I just love that it's it's uh, hit here in London, and and that um, it's bringing it to a whole new generation of audiences. So, yeah, I saw I saw an early workshop version of it in Los Angeles, and was you know deeply amused by it. I thought it was really funny, <laughs> and uh, couldn't believe that they were taking this movie and turning it into a musical. But but it was very clever, and uh, and it was uh, you know a lot of fun. I was uh, didn't see the any of the more recent productions, but I will come back to London to see it here because I hear it's so good, it's worth a trip.